uh, so very quickly, um, who am I? I think it's very important to um, always set the intention for presentations and also um, have the audience understand where I'm coming from. So very quickly, I'll explain that. I am currently the Senior Director of Interactive for the Tribeca Film Institute. Um, I've been with the department since 2011. And since then, we have built out a collection of programs that really focus on artistic support. I would even say 360 artistic support. So we work with uh, storytellers on building their projects, getting them funded, uh, showcasing them, and of course, granting. Um, I should also mention that Tribeca Film Institute is different from the Tribeca Film Festival, even though that's behind me. I do program for the festival, and I'll talk about that a bit more. But the TFI is a year-round nonprofit organization that focuses on global artists as they challenge themselves and each other and our community to build out really meaningful stories. Um, and of course, for my department, I just focus on interactivity. So, I'm having a bit of tech trouble, but I'm back. Okay. So, um, and I should also mention there's about, I think, an eight second delay. So, if I'm speaking, if you don't see the slide, it should come up very soon. So, um, one of the key cornerstones for my department is, of course, our funding. We have been very fortunate for the Ford Foundation to be involved with Tribeca Film Institute since 2011 for the TFI New Media Fund. This year, MacArthur also jumped in to help us build out the TAA Prototyping Fund. Um, so I want to quickly give a shout out to Ford and MacArthur. We work with artists at various stages of development, from conceptual to prototype to pre-production to post. We are there for every step of the journey. Um, and of course, we support interactive and immersive content, and I'll get into that a bit later because there's always confusion about what interactivity means. Um, we also specialize in nonfiction work or even artists that focus on social justice. Um, and currently, we don't have a scripted program, but we are working on it. A few of the projects here, on the left is Priya Shakti. Uh, it focuses on sexual violence through cultural motifs. It actually started with an augmented reality comic book um, and expanded into actual life-size murals on streets of Mumbai and Delhi in India. Um, on the top right, we have Do Not Track, which is a personalized doc about privacy on the web. Um, below is Hollow by Elaine McMillian. It actually won a Peabody last year, and it focuses on migration in the US. A few more uh, on our left is The Enemy. Uh, it focuses on two characters on a particular conflict, and through VR you actually get to engage with each and discuss um, and realize how similar each of us are, even though sometimes we can be on opposite sides of the fence. Question Bridge, I don't think I need an explanation here, but it was also a fantastic project um, that we helped to support, which is about generational conversations um, with black males in the United States. And Kipu, which is the top right, is about forced sterilization in Peru. So very quickly, that's a few of the projects that we have sponsored or granted since 2011. Um, as I also mentioned, we do uh, we actually help artists build out programs. So this one is called Tribeca Hacks. Tribeca Hacks is basically an event where we um, bring people from dis different disciplines together to build out a project in a very short amount of time. Usually it's about two to three days. Um, we have now taken this program internationally. Uh, to the left, we have a project um, that came out of Tel Aviv. On the top right, it was focused on the platform called Jehudi, which is an interactive um, edible weaving <laughs> project, and I can actually link it to, in the Q&A. The bottom right is also a hackathon that took place in Germany um, with the team from Doc Leipzig around interactive documentaries. So this is a great, um, this has been a great project for us because we've been able to really work with a ton of creatives in a short amount of time and really plant the seeds globally. In addition to the hackathon pro programs and to our um, 
work with our grants. We also do a substantial amount of work during the Tribeca Film Festival, even though technically we are not employed at the Tribeca Film Festival. On the left is TFI Interactive. It's a conference that focuses on interactivity. Uh, we focus on bringing people from all the world together to build out a community, to have a discussion, to figure out where the field is heading. Um, on the right, it's a very, very small clip from the interactive playground with the idea of it being um, being more of a showcase to stop talking about people to really explore this phenomenon of interactivity themselves. Um, so I encourage you, if you are around in April 2016, to stop by. You will definitely be in for a treat. For the first time ever, we also brought DEF CON to the Tribeca Film Festival. Now, DEF CON is the largest hacker or underground hacking organization in the world. It takes place in Las Vegas each year in August. Um, they just celebrated the 23rd year and it's basically focused on uh, cybersecurity. Now I think across my entire department it's our job to bridge the gap between technology and story or filmmaking and that's what we try to do here. On the left is the founder of DEF CON, his name is Dark Tangent and he came to speak. Uh, the two pictures on the right are a bit of a showcase of the villages coming to Tribeca Film Festival and teaching filmmakers and our audience as a whole uh, tactical ways to immerse themselves in the world of technology. So on top we have something from the lock picking village and on the bottom we have something from the hardware vi village. But um, it the, was the first year of a very long and hopefully successful partnership and in a few months we can actually dis disclose more of what 2016 will reveal. And also one of the, the last programmings that we have um, within my department is something called Storyscapes. This also takes place at the Tribeca Film Festival. It is curated by Ingrid Kopp, you see here on the left, and it really focuses on full-scale installations around the idea of immersive storytelling. So. Um, yeah, we, are, we, we always have our hands busy, so we have those three main things during the festival. And last but not least, uh, we call this the Tribeca Sandbox. Uh, it is a resource from A to Z on how to build out an interactive project. Uh, this one was actually our last version that we launched last year. Um, we survey the field to ask people about their favorite projects. We actually got, you know, knee deep with some creators and asked them questions about their budgets, their timeline, how they built it out, what recommendations they have. So if you are new to this field, definitely check it out. It's Tribeca Sandbox. I highly recommend it. Um, and with that, <laughs> that's a bit of what we do at the Tribeca Film Institute Interactive Department. So getting to the bulk of today's presentation, um, I wanted to discuss very quickly about what is story, because I think it's very, very important. And I won't get into the narrative structure or archetypes here, but as we go forward in anything that I mention, I have to say that the root of this interactive movement lies in story. Everything is story. Technology is just a fun add-on. but without story, everything would be a bunch of gibberish. So that's very important to realize as I continue to discuss what we're, we're building out. Um, story in itself is also very powerful. It allows us to connect with ourselves, to connect beyond ourselves, to connect with each other. Um, it's a reflection of the times, and it's by far the most powerful tool of engagement that we know of. So what is the current media landscape. Um, you know, why is there such a buzz around interactivity? Why should you be concerned? What's going on? Um, again, uh, another disclaimer, focus on story. Story is paramount. Um, but the main thing that's going on right now is that technologies are opening up distribution models, and it's a great thing. Some people are terrified because it basically is causing havoc on every form of monetary system that we know of, but as a creator, it's definitely beneficial to be in this place in time. Um, a great example of streaming, YouTube, I, everyone knows of it, is phenomenal. It allows each of us to be creators, to have an audience, um, and it has also, on the flip side, allowed a huge pool of people to get funding from YouTube. A great example is uh, the DC Toy Collective. Um, 
I don't know if you guys are, are familiar with the term unboxing where you see someone look through an uh, uh, object or actually on camera take a pe take apart the packaging of um, an object. That is basically the number one or I would say the biggest amount of views outside of music. Um, it averages about 300 million views a month and I believe the last estimate was about 38 million dollars per month are given to YouTube creators around um, the DC Toy Collective and the unboxing movement. So definitely great. Of course, um, we are also very much aware of Netflix. Um, it's changing the way media is consumed. So in addition to what YouTube did, this is even more interesting because we're all becoming, becoming media glutens. Um, we devour content at an astounding rate and there is no end in sight. Something very unique that Netflix is also doing is that um, they are creating re relationships directly with the creators. So Ang Lee is a perfect example. Um, Adam Sandler, uh, recently, I think a week or two ago, they mentioned doing the next series of Black Mirror. So it's becoming a huge platform for original content and it's actually shaking up the stronghold within the studio system. Um, a few other examples would be High Maintenance that started off as a web series and is now at HBO. Easter Ray, which I hope you are all familiar with. Uh, she started off with a web series uh, a few years ago. She was supposed to do something with Shonda Rhimes. I don't think that worked out, but I know she has something in the works with HBO, or allegedly she does. Um, but I'm going to pause here and just talk about John Landgraf. Um, he basically had a speech at the TV Critics Association about the pros and the negatives of being in this age of ever-increasing content. And I won't really focus on the negatives right now. There are, but of course I want to encourage you to explore, so we'll focus on the positives. But um, the benefits in this age is that there are a huge amount of programmers. It's no longer about five people being in a, around the table basically deciding what the entire nation will watch. We are all our own programmers now, or people in our social networks are. Um, there's an increase in content, of course, and the biggest thing is that it's a new opportunities for new newbies or newcomers to really get the chance to get their work out there. Um, and it also allows underserved communities to also have a chance to break through the mode and create the content that they wish to see. So um, I just mentioned how new technologies are changing the way things are consumed. To me, what's more of my focus at Tribeca is um, the actual way that technologies are changing the way we tell stories. So not how we consume them or how we get them, but how we actually tell them. So I'm going to do a word thing. I'm going to paraphrase a paraphraser. So I'm actually currently um, at Snug Harbor at uh, the Future of Storytelling, and earlier today I've heard Sashka Unseld from the Oculus Story Studio discuss uh, Susan Sontag, and she basically, or he basically quoted her saying something to the tune of, um, the book and the film are one, and in both cases the author wants total control. So what's really interesting about interactivity is that it flips the switch. You really can't have total control of interactivity. You can try. There's definitely still the very tightly wound interactive experience where you can push something on the web and A to Z people sit there and they have still a passive experience. But VR is changing the way that we create content. It's exploring the fourth wall, which is you know unheard of in film. There's an audience participatory culture. Um, and of course, it's a general exploration of what happens when you let go of the reins. So from concept to platform, how does that work? So number one again is story, 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 story. Do not approach your project from what's cool to do in tech. If you see the HTC flip brush, I think that's what it's called now, it just recently came out, and you said, oh my god, wouldn't it be so cool if, you know, my story allowed my, my hand to move through it, you are going to fail. 
because at the end of the day, everything needs to be focused on emotion and connection and what it is you want your audience to walk away with. So story is king. If you forget everything that I say tonight, focus on this. At the end of the day, your story, your project has to be rooted in story. Now, a lot of people don't really agree with me on this next one, but I am a huge um, advocate of learning how to code. Like, don't panic. I'm not saying that you need to learn JavaScript, HTML, and C++, and Python, but you should at least attempt to learn at least one language. Why? Because it's really important that you understand the mind frame of how coding actually works. It's very unique. It's very, very different from storytelling. But if you understand the basics of how coding works, and if you can understand at least a language or um, the overarching idea of what it can be, it's going to help you tremendously build out your project, especially understanding what each program or platform is capable of. So um, leading from my last point, do not add on platforms unless necessary. I meet with artists on a weekly basis um, as part of my job at Tribeca, and it's very interesting how, especially with this huge boom of VR, that everyone's doing a VR component to their project. They do a web series, they do VR, they have a card game, and it just gets the idea gets so diffused that in a sense, Sally becomes nonsense. So you only are to add on a platform if it makes sense to the narrative. If it can help a character expand in a different way, if it can allow you to connect with an audience in a meaningful way, then yes. If you are only able to push through a narrative or to revisit something with a new platform, then you can add it to your overarching story world. But if it doesn't, Keep it short, keep it sweet, and just focus on the, the key platform. The smaller, in my, in my opinion, the better. Especially if you don't have that much money and you have a, a team that isn't really there, focus on at least one platform or two platforms. And then, as you get more successful, and if it makes sense to your project, you can build it out. Um, this last point is very important. I think that you should start engaging your audience very, very early. Um, they will be there in the very, very long run. So as you start to say, hey, I have an idea, you know, test it out with a few folks. Have them give you their opinion. What makes sense? What doesn't? And go from there. So, you know, how do you begin? Uh, again, I love thinking big, but you have to start small. Um, Lance Weiler, who is one of our grantees, um, and who is extremely a lot more knowledgeable about doing amazing, crazy stuff. I, I believe he had one of his um, projects like a launching into space. Um, it, it's great to do all these great things, but at the end of the day, start with a very small idea and slowly build out to getting to space. That's very, very important. Uh, get, to know, get to know your local interactive community. Um, this, I think, is extremely important whether you learn to code or not. I would encourage you to participate in a hackathon, especially a story hackathon. It will allow you to possibly find your team. Um, if you have some team members, it will allow you guys to work together um, or even test them out. It will allow you to test out your idea. So definitely try to look at your local community for some help and answers. Iteration. Filmmakers hate this, but this is, this is I think, at every well-known tech company, this is key. This does not, not exist. You are to design, build, test, design, build, test, design, build, test, over and over and over again. Now, I'm not saying that you need to build something and test it out to all the world or put it on YouTube or, you know, send it to your fan base. You can test it with a small group of trusted advisors or friends, but it's important, especially from an interactive landscape, to actively build and figure out what's working, what's not. You know, we are in very, very new territory. No one has all the answers, not myself, not uh, Casper Sonnen at EDFA, not Ingrid Kopp, who used to be the director of this department. At Oops, meaning in Canada, no one has all the answers. So a lot hasn't been done or experienced, so it's really important that you push the boundaries, but you can only do that by actively 
playing with with the boundaries and failing and and pushing forward and eventually succeeding. Now, um, a lot of people also ask how you can get funded. Of course, there's crowdsourcing. Um, I don't want to say that's the easiest way. I actually think it's a lot of work, um, and it requires quite an amount of uh, commitments from you and your team. But it's, of course, a no-brainer. Um, again, hackathons are coming up for the third time tonight. There are many on an international and global landscape that are now adding prizes to their hacks. Um, if not prizes, at least additional developmental support. Um, we have a few of our grantees who got funded because they went through hackathons. We were actually able to see a really uh, viable prototype. I know POV in um, New York also has a great program. In London, there's one called Papa Hack. I would also encourage you guys to also um, view for yourselves. And of course, um, there are grants and festivals. So off the top of my head, there's us, Tribeca, Tribeca Film Festival and Institute, Sundance, um, IDFA, Power to the Pixel, Sheffield, um, Sunny Side of the Lab, um, Doc Leipzig, Cross Video Days. And honestly, each year, there are other festivals that are adding interactive components or actually new interactive festivals popping up. Um, and also very important based on where you are or if you are a dual citizen, if the majority of the people on tonight are, are US citizens, um, there are strong funding, um, funding areas in Canada, in London and France. So it's about, again, diversifying your team. If you are based in the States and if you can get a Canadian producer, they can also apply for funding and it goes on and on and on. But the funding is out there. It's increasing by the month. So again, I want to say that it's a very, very exciting time to get involved um, and just try it out. And I would also say that no one was extremely successful in their first go around. Very few people, I would say. Somewhere, Lane McMillian from Hollow was a great example. But at least start small, start locally, and then build. If you like it, great, continue at it. If you're like, you know, traditional film is more for me, then all the power to you, it's not going away. But interactivity is going to become a powerhouse, and it's going to be everywhere very, very soon. So even if you don't eventually build it out, you should at least understand the components to what it takes to build out a good project. And with that, I will um, end my presentation and take questions. Or Christian, you can come back and um, help me answer questions. <laughs> great, great. Oh, thank you. That was, that made me, um, that was so much great information um all right uh i don't know where to start but i think i'll i'll give the the crowd a second to start typing in their questions just so i don't hog all the time uh you can leave the presentation up just so the okay. people um get a sense as we talk um so you you talked a lot about sort of what what Tribeca is doing and like the what's trending right now Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of people get a little overwhelmed with how much they think they have to take on when they come mm -hmm. up with an interactive project. How, what's the, in your mind, what's the best way where, that you could uh, simplify the thought process for them so that they don't need to be coding experts, but mm -hmm. uh, like you said, the story is the key. Like, where do they start? Like, if they have a great story that at least they think so where do they go next is it meeting a developer is it uh calling up tribeca what do they do that is a fantastic question so if you say you know i have this really great idea and you know it'd be great to have it as a film but if you know if i made it into an interactive web doc i would really be able to really investigate a certain character or i will uh, i will you know be able to make the audience feel a certain way. A perfect example would be um, Do Not Track. Please check it out if you're still here um, or still on the webinar, check it out. It basically leaves you with a sense of paranoia and that could only be done as a web doc or as an interactive project. So that's the key first. If it can be a, a viable product as a film, don't attempt interactivity. It's only when you're like, you know, it needs technology to feel this way or to get that edge, then that's the next step. From there, 
once you say, okay, here's my story, and this is basically how I want the audience to feel, and through this technology I want to do it, I would start meeting with developers. And the best and easiest way is to just sign up for a local hackathon. I cannot stress that enough. They are like, every time I look around, I get emails on a weekly basis asking um, to join a hackathon. Just go. Just go. And at first, it's about articulating your idea. Sometimes you're like, well, I don't really understand OPME. What it is you mean? What do you mean by your story? That, that by itself, that articulation is going to help you pitch to me and other industry leaders or even people who will eventually be on your, top, uh, on your project, understanding what you're actually trying to get from the project itself. That's one from the hackathon. Two is actually like when you have a team, and I'll quickly talk about the hackathon process here. It's usually um, a storyteller, um, a technologist, a designer. That's like the bare minimum. If um, you're a part of our hackathon, we usually throw a bit more at you. But from there, you basically build out a very small scale project that you have to have working within 72 hours for the most part. And that will allow you to quickly see how a developer can work with your idea and, and bring it to life, how a designer can work with your idea and make it beautiful. And that, that process itself will allow you to um, rejig your original idea and or even move it forward. But I think that would be the first stage. I'm a huge, huge, huge advocate for doing hackathons because it's not that much time. It's usually a weekend. But the payoff is huge. You know, I've seen people participate in hackathons that are still together years later, working yeah. on the same projects or new projects or getting funding from somewhere else. So I cannot stress how valuable that experience is. Yeah, I think filmmakers get turned off because they think, you know, is actually the, one of the first questions we have here is, is a hackathon participation a benefit uh, to those who get who are not internet savvy and not well versed in coding? If so, how? Um, I think they get scared off because of the coding part as opposed to they don't get attracted to the collaboration part because that seems mm -hmm. to be the main thing of uh, hackathons. Has that been your experience? You know, that's a great question, uh, T. Davis. We actually started the program in 2011. It was very, very traditional. It was like, you are just a storyteller and you are just a coder and you are a designer. Do not leave your lane. <laughs> and it was, it was a bit miserable, <laughs> fun, but miserable. People were like, well, OPME, um, I would have a lot of coders saying, I don't want to basically be working for a filmmaker. I'm giving up my weekend. I want to be a creative artist, too. Right. And that, after 2012, we actually moved into a much more collaborative um, process where everyone, in a sense, contributed to the direction of the story. And from them, equally, they build it out. We also try to do, um, and not all of our hackathons have this, but going forward in 20. Uh, 16 they will. We'll also do mini workshops within the hackathon to help people learn what the other person is doing. So if you are a storyteller, you won't be able to, I would say, execute a great code by the end of the hackathon, but you at least understand what the person across from you is doing. Right. Same thing for the coder. They'll be like, okay, now I understand a bit more about Final Cut Pro or the narrative structure, but it's really about understanding what the other person from the other side is doing and how together, as different parts of the mind, we can collaborate and meld to have this total or super brain, if you will. <laughs> um, and so very quickly, T. Davis, um, it really depends on the hackathon. For the most part, especially the ones that are story focused, you don't need to be well versed in coding. I would encourage you to do it, not because um, it'll help you, it'll just, um, it won't help you in the event, but I think it will help you overall in your long term um, role as a storyteller to develop really great projects. Um, what, what would you suggest in terms of people doing that? Uh, my, I mean, I, I don't do a lot of coding. Uh, I just remember that last year in high school when we were supposed to be designing the yearbook uh, online. It was really cool. Uh, so <laughs> the question is something like Code Academy. Do you think that's right. Absolutely. Right. I love Code Academy. And I, um, I luckily also took high school classes with coding. <laughs> right. Um, and sometimes just to refresh my skills on HTML5 or JavaScript, I just sign on and do a few courses to, you know, flex my muscles. Okay. I, and I, I would say, um, uh, I think, and I could be wrong, I think black 
girls, black girl code, maybe extending their reach to do more workshops in the community and not just focusing on young youth. I could be wrong, so okay. Google that before you actually say that OPME said that. <laughs> um, but each time, and I personally would love to also do this at Tribeca to do more community code workshops as a bandwidth question at this point. But it's, it's, I think, increasing this idea of communities and especially people of color um, immersing themselves in technology and code. So it's definitely. definitely great. Definitely. All right, folks, does anyone else? Oh, okay, another question. Uh, for a filmmaker, in essence, interactivity is a, is a uh, using technological platforms to prepare your audience for your film. Uh, I don't totally so understand that. I think I get it, and this is, I mentioned this very early in um, the talk about the issue with the word interactivity. In a sense, like just me moving my mouse right now, I, I don't know if you can see it, but yeah, I'm I moving see. my mouse. Okay, that's in a sense is interactive. You know, so that's the issue with the word. When I say interactive, I'm talking about using technology in a way that impacts your audience or the story. So I, I hate using VR because it's it's too over, I mean, it's spoken about so much, but that's a great example. VR is very, very different from film. So I'm not just talking about doing a promo or doing um, uh, a website that's pub publicity or some type of promotion. I'm talking about using technology that really changing the story layout or um, how you can view it. So it's something that you could never ever experience on a normal screen in the theater. Right. You would need to own a set of Oculus glasses from Google, or is that what you're saying? Something like that? Yeah. Or even let's say, let's say if we're not even talking about VR. Um, a perfect example would be the project I mentioned, Do Not Track. And I'm going to give a bit of the surprise away, but basically as you log onto that website, um, it actually pulled information from your laptop and as it's the documentary, so each person has a very individual experience. So it can tell if you're where, where you're located based on your IP address, your time zone, what type of Mac you're using. And as the story progresses, the documentary progresses, it gets creepier and creepier. <laughs> and, and, and the sad thing, it, it's, it's not... Um, it's not fake. This is what's going on in the real world. So it's like a, it's multiple levels of um, of paranoia that I get when I'm experienced. Do not track, and I could never get that if I was on um, if I was in the theater because it would be it would be a very passive observation. And here the technology is re-triggering me to investigate the story and the content based on the knowledge that it's pulling from my own data. Great. Um, and yes, very quickly, Lillian VR stands for virtual reality. Yes, yes. Uh, what are we talking about in terms of, Keisha asks, uh, in terms of funding, for example, if you can share uh, what was the uh, budget for Do Not Track versus the Hollow Project? Sure. Um, well, hi, Kay, very quickly. <laughs> um, I, I know Hollow was on a very small scale budget. It was not for... Um, and I hope the filmmakers will forgive me for disclosing it. But, uh, I know for a fact that it was under $100,000 for Hollow. Um, Do Not Track actually started from a hackathon that we did with Mozilla. Uh, so that combined with funding from Arte in France, NFB in Canada, and a few others, I would say the minimum of that was probably around half a million. I could be completely wrong. So again... Um, I would probably check with Brett Gaylor, who heads up Do Not Track and Elaine McMillian, but I'm pretty sure um, Do Not Track was a substantial a lot more than Hollow. Wow, so the scale is definitely wide. Um, yes. And it's all yes. about like how much story you, you need to tell and what the technology is. Um, it's it's more on technology. Uh, Do Not Track was a lot, uh, was much heavier on uh, the coding, the tech, a lot of the things that you used before hasn't been done, so they had to start from the building ground, or they actually had to build the block to support the project. So that's Hollow. personnel, that's time and personnel, is that what we're paying yep, for? Yeah, that, that's, wow. that's time and personnel um, and talents, yeah. 
Um, Hala was also very unique of the way you, it was a very simple scrolling mechanism, right. but how the infographics and the sound were used was very unique, but it was, I don't want to say a lesser type of code, because that would minimize the work that the team did, it's just okay. different, and it, would, it was easier to accomplish. It was like an immersive that. experience that sort of, you know, didn't, didn't need a lot of hard code, you mean? Yes. Yes, okay. Not as much as do not track. Right, right, right. No, 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 I can understand that. Okay. Um, do, do we have any other questions in the uh, in the audience? Any recommendations on a story-based hackathon? Now, it really depends on where you are. If you're in the tri-state area, um, POV, uh, Adnan Wasi, oh, you're in Cali. Okay, so there's a story code... Um, there's a story called LA Branch. So Aina Abiodu and Mike Knowlton in New York started this great organization called Story Code. It focuses on new media and transmedia work. They also have story hacks. Um, I believe Kel O'Neill does something in LA. But if you're in California, you're also super close to San Francisco, and that is like the hub of all things hackathon. So I'm pretty sure if you Google it, you will find more than you can even dream of. All right, excellent, excellent. Um, more questions, guys? We have time if you uh, if you want to say more. Uh, yeah, sure. I'm, I'm, how about you ask me something, Christian? It would be <laughs> easier for me. <laughs> Uh, okay, let's see. Could you uh, talk a little bit about sort of the what uh, Tribeca funding in terms of access or what's coming up uh, for the next year or so? Because I think a lot of people don't have specific projects at the moment, uh, but when they think of it, uh, I want them to be able to go back and say, I saw this really great presentation. Uh, let me sort of like find out uh, how I can, if this fits. Sure. So I can say that we have another um, funding cycle happening next year for from the Ford Foundation. And very quickly, the New Media Fund gives out grants from $50,000 to $100,000 um, each cycle. Um, that is the definite. We are actively working on other things, which I can't talk about, but it is my goal Ooh, as secret. senior director, secret, <laughs> to actively pursue this. So if you check back with me, I hope we will have answers in a few months for everyone. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, more questions. Mark says, or let's start. Yeah, Mark says, how about interactive or interface and portal design? I, I need a, Mark, give me a bit more. What exactly about that? Um, and we can come back to your question. Yes, let's do that. Uh, Jacqueline says, uh, what do you know about what's going on in interactive abroad? to engage oh, audiences. After. I love you, Jacqueline. <laughs> I, so I'm also Nigerian. I was born in the States, but I'm um, heavily Nigerian. Go Nigeria. <laughs> yes, we're ruling this <laughs> webinar tonight. <laughs> hey, it's like, OK, he's never coming on anymore. Uh, so there is a lot happening, Jacqueline. Um, it's, it's very interesting for a few reasons. Sadly, I think. The world thinks of the continent of Africa as being this decrepit place where all there is is, you know, AIDS and starvation, and that is not the call. That is not the case at all. Yes, there have been some tra tragedies, but um, there is a huge, and I mean huge, uptake of creativity happening there, especially in the technology sector. Um, and across the board, I believe they're saying 80% of all Africans will be online in the next five to ten years wow. um, so they, especially there is an active funding happening not just by Africans themselves but there's a lot of Chinese money coming in that's addressing internet in totality um, and therefore and therefore transforming um, the art scene so I know for a fact South Africa has a very strong presence. Ingrid Kopp is now there, and she reports back very actively about stuff that she's seeing there. I know um, Nairobi in Kenya is doing fantastic work. I'm Nigerian, so I always keep an eye on what's going on there. They are doing spectacular work, and it goes on and on and on. So um, I would also heavily look to the continent of Africa for remarkable work being showcased very soon. Excellent. Uh, I think Cassandra has a question. Uh, can you also comment further about where 
uh, virtual reality is heading in the film industry. Uh, I keep hearing that is where it's headed, and I think this is this will include in the traditional theater environment and not just digital digital thoughts, digital thoughts. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic question. So as I mentioned before, I was hanging out with Sashka, who is the co-founder of Oculus Story Studio, and he used to work at Pixar. And I also was able to connect with Glenn Queen today, who um, is the the animator for great Disney classics like Little Mermaid or Tarzan, Pocahontas, and he's also working with Google. So the interesting thing now is that tech and art is combining in a really interesting way. The issue is that a lot of old Hollywood is very, very stuck on that film right. and community presence, and it's not a bad thing. I think it, I think being in the theater is beautiful. I think it's a spiritual practice, actually. Um, <laughs> but a lot of people see VR. A lot of a lot of people in Hollywood see VR as a gimmick or a way to promote something, and not really as a source of true um, content or dissemination. Right. So it's possible that um, Hollywood will shift. I actually think VR has a much stronger chance of really gaining the momentum in the gaming world. I think when gaming and VR combine, our heads are going to explode because it's going to be so much sensory input that we're getting. Um, but I would say it's going to take, I would say, three years to get really good VR projects seen by the public. Right now, it's so new that people... They don't really know what they're doing. It's going to take a few years to really build the momentum, and then hopefully, if there's a shift with some of the um, the, the gatekeepers in Hollywood, right? Uh, the, we'll see uh, the transformation. Sorry about sorry, Christian. You were saying something. No, I was saying once there's a shift, as you're saying in the in the money uh, or in the old school establishment, there there might be more to inf influence the storytelling. Is that what you mean? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Great. Uh, okay. I have, I think, a couple more questions, and then I, I can let you guys go tonight. Uh, Damon says, would Tribeca be willing to fund the interactive engagement piece of uh, a scripted project, assuming that the engagement piece could stand on its own? Ooh, that is an interesting project. Oh, so currently... No, unless you were somehow able to have the engagement piece tied to strong nonfiction or socially focused work. If it could stand on its own and tied to those two, two things, yes, for from the Ford Foundation, the, the TFI New Media Fund. Um, I'm trying very hard, very hard to get hard to get hard to get a so hopefully check in with me again and I may have a different answer for you soon. Great. Uh, and then uh, Malkia or someone else. Let's see. Let's see. Uh, Lillian, Lillian says, I, I don't do films but produce a health talk show. Within the show I tell a patient's story and I'm looking for ways to move those stories interactively. Could that be a project idea to bring to a hackathon? Uh, any other thoughts? Absolutely. Absolutely. I should also say um, our hackathons are very different because before you even get to the hackathon, I pair people up together and have them start brainstorming before they come. But there are also um, hackathons which we call ad hoc hackathons where you basically get up on the first day and – um, talk about your idea, and then people who are inspired by it or interested in it then join your team. So I would just, um, when you look to do hackathons, make sure you do ad hoc. Or if it is a prepared hack, like I do, just make sure you tell the organizer that this is what you're looking for, and hopefully they can get, they can get you the right team support. Great. Uh, and let me just a little plug here. We're having our first MBPC hackathon this October. Um, yeah. We're, yeah, it'll be it'll be like you said ad hoc sort of. So it's sort of uh, the sign up session or process is over right now. Um, but what we're trying to do is build on this idea that black stories can also be told in this context. Uh, so moving mm -hmm. forward, really interested in uh, the folks on this line being able to. Think about that as, as a source for them coming forward. 
Um, and Mark Shapley says, I've been looking at some awesome interactive documentaries produced out of Australia. One called The Block, uh, an Aboriginal culture based with a great engaging layout with Flash. And another Aussie one called Cronulla Riots, both very interesting. Uh, Transmedia Interactive Interface Production. Just curious about design concepts. Um, I don't understand the question so much, but those are great sources uh, or project shares. Uh, we can all sort of like write that down and Google it and see, check out the projects. Because I think part of what this thing is, is seeing more projects uh, and sort of trying to enjoy them. Like try to make yourself watch in more interactive stuff. And then it will trigger, exactly. It'll trigger more in terms of how you think about your own interactive projects. Uh, yes, T. Davis, we'll, we'll have this webinar recording available hopefully by Monday. Uh, and we will, if Amy is open to it, share a slide presentation, her slide sure. presentation, uh, and then do a PDF and upload it to the Black Public Media website, um, which is at blackpublicmedia.org. So you don't have to remember everything we're talking about. The recording will be available and it'll be accessible to you. Excellent. Okay, great. Oh, thanks for sharing that link, Mark. So let us see. It is currently time to say goodbye. Um, but thank you so much, Amy. This was awesome. Um, no, thank you for inviting me. I had a great time. We'll do it again. We'll do it again, definitely. You know how we Nigerians be. Um, yeah. <laughs> thank you, Kay. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Uh, so sorry to keep giving you the Nigeria jokes, but we uh, we're, we get excited <laughs> when we meet other Nigerians. <laughs> uh, I love okay, it. I know, right? All right. So everybody, thank you so much again. We will um, again, as I said, share this recording on our website, uh, and feel free as we move forward to go to the website. Uh, share your questions with uh, MDPC. Uh, we like to do this every year or every month. Uh, we have another session coming up in November uh, and one more uh, in December, and each of them will focus on different things. Uh, the October or the November session is focused on finding your target audience, uh, and the December session is about impact. Um, so we we like to diversify. We've been doing these since August. Um, please just check out the website, sign up for the ones that make sense for the kinds of project you're working on, uh, and we'll keep bringing them. Thank you so much.